So uh, welcome everybody to uh, the Delphi Talks. Um, as you know, it's our regular live talk uh, on the theme of storytelling. Um, our guest tonight is Jeremy Dalton, who you've seen uh, dancing in the background there, um, who Jeremy, among other things, um, in his other endeavours, is the uh, VR lead, VR and AR lead for PwC. Um, but perhaps before formally introducing Jeremy, a couple of, uh, a couple of tips um, especially useful for people who may be new uh, to the Delphi talks uh, and new to this region. Um, really, the tips are about the, the buttons. All the buttons on the UI are functional. Uh, let me quickly explain them. Um, the, at the top of your screen, you'll see uh, a seating button. Um, and if you uh, click that, you'll see various sit options um, and click on one and it will sit you down. Um, if you decide that you uh, want to change seats, you uh, just click um, stand up, which you'll see in the middle of, uh, of the bottom of the UI. And you can stand up and move around and uh, sit down somewhere else. Um, the other buttons are generally uh, camera angles. Um, they're fairly self-explanatory. They look at the screen or the speaker or the room, or they pan around. Um, if you click on one and then you know want to get out, um, just press look away, which is the button which will appear at the bottom of the uh, screen uh, in green. So just press look away and that will get you out of that particular camera view and return you to a sort of standard first person view. Um, there is chat, um, which you can see will be in what we call local chat, which is uh, the Delphi. Um, feel free to uh, make comments in there. Um, and we'd love you to ask questions and sort of you know, make the session interactive. We may, in fact, leave the questions until the end um, simply for the flow. Um, and then we will uh, do a sort of Q&A uh, for the last 10 minutes and hopefully sweep up all of those questions. Um, can they ask questions in the middle, Sean? They can. And just ask them. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, obviously, the mic is, is only open to, you, to us too. So questions will be asked in the chat. Um, which I think both of us can see, but I'll probably, yep. um, it's easy for me then to re-ask the questions. But yes, just carry on and, and ask questions. If I, if I miss one, uh, we've got a team of people that I'm sure will uh, point them out. Um, so I think that's really the housekeeping dealt with. Uh, anyone gets stuck, ask in there. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a big hello and a welcome to everybody, especially our first time visitors. Um, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to have you join us for this Delphi Talks which um, has the title, The Importance of VR and AR in Society. But um, I think as we go through, uh, it will be rather uh, wide ranging. Um, so, Jeremy, uh, welcome to you. Um, Many thanks, Sean. That's right. Uh, sort of consultant, mathematician, chartered accountant. Um, when I was re reading your bio, I imagined... Uh, when you told your parents you were going to specialise in the sort of frivolous world of the virtual, they gave you a, a similar <laughs> look to um, the look Billy Ellett's parents gave him when he told me he was going to become a, a ballet dancer. So perhaps you can give us a bit of background and kind of what led you into uh, the wonderful world of VR and AR. Sure. The, the trick is not to ask for permission, but forgiveness. Yes. yes. I'd say that's the yeah. ultimate message there. Yeah. Um, funnily enough, it's been, it's been a strange career tra trajectory. Um, I've been involved in all sorts of um, jobs and careers from teaching uh, or not teaching, summarizing lectures, no, lecture notes more accurately for disabled students at universities, yeah. um, all the way through to teaching mathematics online, uh, being a chartered accountant in PwC in the audit division, moving on to business recovery, uh, innovation, um, consulting, and then finally specialising in virtual reality and augmented reality, which is where I'm uh, I'm banking on my on my future career and yeah. going all in on the technology. So it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to speak to you about the tech that I think is going to form a significant part of both our professional and personal lives. Well, we look forward to it. The, the other question I guess uh, people will be asking themselves is, um, you know, what is PwC? you know, one of the big four professional services firms, um, you know, sort of doing with VR and AR, what's in it for them, what's in it for your, for your client? You know, we all think you're supposed to be laser focused on, you know, accountancy and taxation. And uh, when you're not doing that, sort of briefing the media on the other big three, when you think there's a conflict in their audit clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a fair, it's a, you are in VR. 
It's a fair challenge. And um, you're right, for the last hundred or so odd years, PwC has been primarily involved in uh, or perceived to be involved in a lot of accounting work and a lot of taxation advice work. Um, but of course, you know, we have to move with the times and we have to to be there, not only to offer those services to our clients, but also to offer them um, services that will ultimately help their business and help them grow um, as companies. And part of that remit is definitely looking at technology. And we have an entire team looking at technology, thousands of people around the globe um, and specifically recently, virtual reality and augmented reality has come onto the radar of our clients across all different industries as well, because they want to know what is the big deal about VR and AR? Why should we care? And you know, how can we derive business value from implementing those technologies? What should we be worried about? And, uh, and what is there to gain? So that is ultimately, those are the sort of exam questions that we're there to help clients with. Yeah. And, and you're seeing that across sort of all sectors that that sort of inquiry yes um, the, the wonderful thing is a lot of a lot of people ask me so jeremy which sector or which industry are you seeing the most interest in virtual reality and augmented reality and i i i always say that there is no single industry that i can point to where there is a significant uptake or interest in the in VR AR technology versus any other. We've had everyone from uh, retail stores to banks to utility companies to oil and gas companies inquire about the potential of this technology. Yeah. Okay. Um, behind you, uh, being ably managed by um, Rowan. Uh, is a screen. Um, and just to let everybody know, we're, we're going to put some sort of aid memoirs up there. Um, and I think the first one is, it, it, which we'll speak to is um, really to give, you know, a brief introduction to VR, AR. Um, and I think it's sort of historical context, you know, when you and I spoke, Jeremy, you know, o offline about this particular talk, um, you know, intriguingly, you know, you talked about you know, you know, VR being around as early as the 1800s. So, so perhaps a bit of bit of background and introduction and, and, and historical context. Sure, sure. So, starting with the intro, um, I'd I'd actually be interested in the in the audience answering this in the chat if they're able to. Yeah. So, if you've got access to the chat window, everyone, could you let me know what you would say your knowledge of VR and or AR is currently on a scale of one to ten? So 10 being, you know, I know everything inside out in this industry, I've been involved in the last 30 years or so uh, with it. And uh, one being, I literally know almost nothing, but I'd love to learn more. So if you just want to put that in the chat window. Oh, we've I got can, a 10. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> 3, 9, 11. Well, Rohan's gone from 10 to 11. So Rohan should be in this talk. <laughs> 12 and rising. Okay, we'll just have to kick him out. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. 11 plus, yeah. I okay. don't know how you get 11 plus when it's 1 to 10, but uh, <laughs> there's a battle going on here. Okay, for the sake of, uh, of those who are closer to 3, 4, and 5, um, to give you an intro into the technologies here, and there are loads of terms out there now. It's not only virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, everyone is trying to consolidate the industry and make it a bit more understandable, but I personally think that uh, we're going in the opposite direction and making it more difficult. But you might have heard terms like mixed reality, merged reality, extended reality, XR, immersive technologies, and it's it, it gets a bit confusing, I'll admit, but if you consider everything as a spectrum of virtual reality or augmented reality, that that's the way we view it at PwC, and and arguably that's an easy way to understand the tech. So yeah. virtual reality is all about immersion. It's about being in a completely different world outside of your current reality, your current space and time. Augmented reality is all about uh, information. It's where you're still in the real world, but we're presenting an overlay of information or and or virtual objects on top of the real world so that you can understand it better, so that you it can be contextualized, it can provide you with um, extra steps on how to buy the the phone that you're looking at with your smart glasses or with your mobile phone that you're pointing at um, 
the street and it's navigating you to get to the nearest pub, whatever it is, that's augmented reality. And that is ultimately the, the main difference between the two technologies and everything else can be argued to be a spectrum on either the VR or AR side. Okay. Um, talk to us a, a bit about this idea that VR was was actually around in the 1800s, you know, this idea sure. of panoramic paintings. Yeah, so the, if we go to slide three, um, this will be, bring a little bit of context up. And yeah, there we go. So most people think that virtual reality and augmented reality is, uh, is a new technology. And in fact, it's not new at all. Now, you'll see in the next slide when arguably it really started getting serious, um, but you can draw it back even further than that arguably to the 1800s, and depends how far, how abstract you want to get with it. But the reason I say the 1800s is this was a period of time where panoramic paintings became a big thing. It was where you could have, and by panoramic paintings, I mean these floor to ceiling paintings that are maybe four, five, six, seven, ten 10 meters in, that are spanning across the room in width. And the idea there is that that wasn't a technology. That was very much an art, a painting. But if we abstract the objective of virtual reality technology nowadays in that it, was tr it is trying to immerse you in a completely different world, that very same objective fits with panoramic paintings and the like. If you went up to that panor panoramic painting, you felt somewhat immersed in that battle scene in this case. If you want to look at this one, I think this is the Battle of Waterloo. Mm. Um, but were, that, they, were they painted in such a way as to sort of draw you in, you know, you get clever paintings that give you give you a, a sense of um, movement and dynamism, or, or there's just a flat canvas and it was just a, the, the pure scale of the thing that, that made you kind of feel immersed. As far as I know, and this is a fairly ignorant opinion when it comes to the art world, I believe it was about the scale and it was about making you feel immersed through the sheer scale of the painting. Mm. Mm. It's a good painting. And, and, um, the this this sort of there's a the sort of 1800 or 70 century paint paintings and then if we come a bit closer to, to today to the 1960s um I, I think there was vr technology then wasn't there or all be it it was so bad that we kind of hit that trough of disillusionment um yeah we're, we're, we're kind of climbing out of so <laughs> Yeah, so arguably there are three phases of serious um, virtual reality technology. And the first one started in the 1960s when uh, you had academics like even Sutherland from MIT on the right here who started experimenting with the first heavy-duty uh, VRAR headsets. And this one was called the Sword of Damocles mm. for because of the way it, it ominously hung above you there and sort of came down up, uh, above you. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see an invention by a chap called Morton Heilig, and he created the Sensorama, and this was a multi-sensory experience where you could you could basically put your head into that machine and 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 for example be on a cycling trip in. Uh, in, in on a certain route and while you were going through the the rose fields for example he could pour a scent of roses into that machine and you would get that that all factory experience mm. but beyond the 1960s if we go to the next slide um this is probably most interesting a lot of people might remember um about this um if we go on to slide five it should pop up it's the second phase of uh of uh, virtual reality, and that is the um, the 1990s, so early early 1990s, late 1980s, and I call it the the height of VR misery here, yes. because and I'm curious actually from the audience, w did anyone try virtual reality back in the late 80s, early 90s? There was a very famous company called the Virtuality Group that was pushing a lot of these headsets, particularly in in arcades and the like. Um. Yes, a couple of people did. Uh, Sun did, and Julie says that um, she tried them at Disney. Uh, okay. Apple, Apple Pie wasn't alive. There'll be a few of, them, <laughs> a few of those. Um, and in fact, um, do, as you're sort of talking about that, just have a think about this. Uh, Liberty asked, "What about holograms?" Um, yeah. In the context of the, sort of the painting and. 
So, uh, okay, to go on to the holograms point, I'd say um, when it comes to holograms, it depends on exactly what you mean. But, for example, the the holograms that appear in the Microsoft HoloLens, which is a high-end augmented reality device, or Microsoft would call it a mixed reality device, um, th those are very much in the augmented reality space. However, if you're talking about um, holograms that are um, there without the use of a wearable, um, usually through a, a prism or the like, um, then that arguably is a separate science in itself. And some people might include it in the augmented reality space, but it's quite different in that you do not have ownership in a sense of it. Um, it's not something that goes with you. It's not a mobile phone. It's not a wearable. It's more of a fixed hologram that an external director works on. So it depends on how you want to define it. But going back to um, the, the point about the late 80s and early 90s, uh, Apple Pie and, and, and Moon Sparrow not being around then, uh, it's probably you're probably one of the, the lucky ones. <laughs> that was that was not a particularly pleasant time for the industry. It was as I as I mentioned, it was the height of VR misery. If you imagine paying probably the equivalent of what are we working in dollars or or pounds dollars uh, today dollars. Okay, so imagine paying about ten or fifteen dollars to have a go on one of these really chunky, um, heavy machines and putting on this headset which is you know, three or four kilograms in, in, in weight, really uncomfortable, really thick, thick piping sticking out of it. Um, and then ultimately when you get into the experience, it's really, really blocky graphics, nothing that you would have ever experienced before, unless you played really old, um, abandonware games. I'm talking, uh, graphics along the lines of, um, doom, that, that sort of level of graphics and not the new doom. I'm talking about the very, very first version of doom. Um, but imagine trying to have a virtual reality experience with those sorts of graphics. And then in addition to all of that, you have a, a lag between when you move your head and when the scene moves with you. Not yeah. a very big lag. I'm not talking seconds here, but I'm talking enough to be perceived by your brain and to make you feel somewhat ill. So very, very, um, it, it didn't meet the hype of or that the, that society placed on the on the technology because there was a lot of hype back then and um, we'll mention later on some of the media that drove that hype or or arguably were released as a result of that hype um, but the the key summary line is the technology at the time didn't have the processing power to meet that level of hype and to actually create real life believable experiences where you could feel a sense of presence or a sense of believability uh, that you're in this world and you feel it. Um, so ultimately, the technology took a, a bit of a, a dive from then and went into this trough of disillusionment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you talk about the height of misery in the 80s. I mean, my, you know, some might say, although we're, you know, if we talk about the Gartner thing, we're kind of, kind of climbing up to that peak of expectation. Uh, some might say it's pretty miserable now. You know, you've got to pay three grand <laughs> for a decent one. It makes you feel sick. And, um, you know, it, it's it's an impediment. Um, I guess there are more there are more impediments than that. I know that the price of these things are coming down and they're getting better. But but what what have you seen in the past that stopped sort of widespread adoption? And what have so, we seen present and what's going to change? So in the past, the key thing was processing power and the cost of being able to process at such a high um, level of fidelity. Nowadays, that problem is largely solved. Uh, but as you mentioned, cost remains an issue, particularly for the consumer space. Mm -hmm. I would argue that for businesses, cost is no longer an issue um, whatsoever, unless you're doing it on a, on a very large scale. So for the cost, we're talking about uh, in dollars, $800 um, for a high-end VR headset. Uh, the, the bigger cost is the computer that accompanies it. Uh, that would cost another $1,000 to $1,500 and even further, depending on how far you want to go. Yeah. Um, so all in all, a package of $2,000 to $2,500 to get you know, a high-end VR experience, unless you already have a gaming PC in the house, is, is, is outside of the reach of a lot of consumers, but not outside the reach of most businesses who would be more than willing to invest that level of money if they could see some sort of efficiency um, or uh, enhancement from it. So that's one challenge currently, cost.
for consumers particularly. Um, the second challenge is actually around the user experience. And I'd say this is, this is ultimately probably the biggest challenge. By user experience, I mean both from a hardware, a software, and how people use it perspective. So the hardware arguably is clunky, it's still fairly heavy. It's not as swish as the technology that we're used to. It's certainly, I don't think, cannot can be described as fashionable in any way. I think people still suffer from uh, feeling embarrassed when they put on the put on a headset sometimes, especially when they know others are watching. Um, so, and, and then that's the the hardware perspective. The resolution of the screens, even though they're higher than full HD. Um, something that we're all used to nowadays, you still have issues because the screen is so close to your face, you can tell the pixels. And that's not great when you're trying to live stream a sports event, for example. It's just, it's just not on for a society that is used to watching everything in crisp, clear 4K screens now, let alone full HD. Um, and then in addition to that, actually running these in your house, for example, and I, and I have one in my living room, um, you know, I have to set up the base stations. I've drilled them into my wall. Each one needs a power supply. Uh, there's a wire going from my headset to my computer. My computer's in the bedroom, so I drilled a hole in my wall between my bedroom and my living room to get the cable across so I could run it off the computer in my bedroom but actually be in the living room, which is the only place I have any space. Um, and, you know, this is, this is just not on for... Uh, um, for a society that is used to instant gratification, where we just want to turn on the TV and we just want to get going with the form of entertainment that we've chosen. Um, so that's user experience in a nutshell. Uh, the other big issue, we've mentioned cost, we've mentioned um, user experience, education is a big thing. So a lot of people in the world really don't have a a solid understanding of what this technology can do. And by that, I mean... Uh, talks like this will will only get you about 50% of the way. The other 50% has to be via trying firsthand virtual reality and augmented reality, because only then when you start to feel how the technology is, that's when you can truly understand its potential. Right. Just um, Liberty Bell Lyric, who clearly has shares in uh, ASOS, just in case anyone was thinking of, uh, <laughs> prompted to go online and buy a computer, says something called a... ROG Acer 64G of RAM with a 1070 NVIDIA will we'll handle it, uh, apparently. So there, there we have a, a solution for one of our guests. Um, so sort of getting on, I suppose, to, to the main sort of storytelling theme of this, which was all about VR and AR um, and its importance to society. You know, and this idea of the sort of dystopian view of, of omnipresent VR. Um, when we talked about this, you know, you made the point that it's not the tech, which is a sort of good versus evil um, conversation. Had it's about how we we use it. I mean, what what good is VR going to do for society? So, if we move to slide ten, um, this should uh, this should explain it. But ultimately, the point is that whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality artificial intelligence, blockchain, you can pick any form of emerging technology. You can even pick, um, uh, you can pick any technology uh, that's in the past, smartphones, for example, and you can point to a time where, or you can point to potential that the technology has for good and for evil as well. And it's the, absolutely the same thing with virtual reality. So, for example, um, you can think about uh, potential evil scenarios that virtual reality could be used for. What if it's used for training for uh, all sorts of nefarious purposes around the world? What if people get addicted to it? Yes. Um, and, th and that is the basis, actually, of... Um, um, or part part of the basis, let's say, of a film that's coming out in March this year called Ready Player One. You might have seen it uh, flick through on the slides there. Um, will it exacerbate any mental illnesses? Um, I'm not saying any of these are true or um, or likely to happen in any way, but it's important to be aware of what could happen, to be um, and to be aware of how we can mitigate those um, those those actions and use the technology responsibly. Uh, but we also have to balance that view with the good that the technology could do as well. So if you think about it from a very basic sense, entertainment is not good in the traditional sense of uh, uh, you know, saving the world or solving uh, world poverty, 
but it is a form of uh, of good in a way in terms of occupying people's time and giving them pleasure. But yeah. in it, but getting closer to the to the end of the spectrum of you know saving the world, uh, virtual reality is already being used for um, for various forms of. Uh, or treatment of alle- or alleviation, let's say, of dementia. It's mm-hmm. being used to manage phobias. So if you have a fear of heights or a fear of spiders or a fear of whatever it is, you can manage that fear um, in, in a very controlled environment through virtual reality that still affects you, but is ultimately safe at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And, and wellness, of course, um, being able to um, uh, actually create a level of mindfulness and being able to take you outside of maybe a stressful workplace for a period of time so you can recharge those batteries and and relax in a sense and get your stress levels down and those good. are only only a few of the potential good parts of techno of, of virtual reality the main point is it's the virtual reality is not good or evil it is ultimately up to humans as to how they use this technology whether for good or whether for evil and ultimately where there is an evil purpose available we have to be aware of it we have to talk about it we have to discuss it and we have to try and and manage and mitigate it and use the technology responsibly it's interesting in fact there's a julie uh, who is in the audience and is one of our um earlier earlier uh, creators came on board very early um and is researching a phd uh is doing quite a lot around the vr um and its usefulness with helping autism sufferers and alzheimer's um sufferers and, uh, and because julie and i and, and son actually put together a um uh, 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 entered a competition for actually a Microsoft HoloLens. I got to know quite a bit about how it does help, and it, it really looks as though it could be a breakthrough um, in autism uh, and al- Alzheimer's. So we'll have to watch this space. Um, Heike mentions paranoia. I don't know whether that uh, and question mark whether the, whether she's asking whether VR could be helpful with paranoia. I guess it might might be. I guess we're not medics here, but it might be able to. Um. Um. Jeremy, when I pose the question to you, which was a sort of central question that we were theming this particular talk around, is the search for a killer VR or AR application the right approach to understanding this technology? You threw your arms up um, and uh, looked at me in horror and said, well, you know, that's the wrong question. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I get to understand why it's the wrong question. Um, but you look so pained. I imagine it must be why is it the wrong, wrong question. Because I think people get very stuck in thinking that they have to find this one killer app that the technology um, uh, can can help with, and and once they find that killer app, there's going to be a massive gold rush. Um, and everybody's going to be all over it, and that one app is going to save the technology and save the day, and everybody's going to be rich. And I think this is it's completely the wrong attitude, and it happens to be also the, the, the wrong question as well, because virtual reality is not a simple technology. It's not, it's not a, a, a one-trick pony by any means. And in fact, I, I argue in, in, in different talks that virtual reality is the the most impactful um, storytelling or immersive storytelling medium we've created in humanity's history. And storytelling is ultimately the basis of all our human interactions, whether in the consumer world to entertain people or whether in the business world to persuade people, to inform people. Um, And ultimately, virtual reality, its key strength is within the storytelling space. So it has loads of applications. If we we go to slide um, 11, this is where it starts off. And you can just, um, uh, Rohan, you can just cycle through the next few slides and I'll go through them. Uh, but slide 11 starts with a very obvious, uh, uh, very obvious use case, which we're seeing right now in society, which is which is video gaming, effectively. And uh, when it loads up, it will show you a uh, yeah, there we go, a picture of uh, of Skyrim. I happen to have Skyrim VR on uh, on my PlayStation VR here at home, 
and uh, it's it's okay. I won't I won't hype it up too much. I think um, there's still improvements to be made in the in the user interface from a virtual reality perspective. But ultimately, it's very um, the idea of using virtual reality for gaming is is definitely there, and uh, I think that's that's a no brainer that will continue to to grow. If we move on to the next slide, though, and we move into more of a business context and more of a an augmented reality context, here we have a company called uh, Tyson Krupp. You may have heard of them or you may have seen their logo embossed in escalators and lifts oh, yes. all over the world. And this chap here, this engineer, is using a Microsoft HoloLens high-end augmented reality device, which is telling him about the, the job he's currently looking at. So it could tell him about the specific um, piece of the elevator he's looking at it could he could say right i want to perform an x procedure on this and it would then potentially highlight a certain uh, element of the elevator in real life and he could then know more effectively how to perform those actions he could have remote assistance from senior engineers back at base so there's no longer a need to have a senior engineer on site with every other engineer who's looking at a lift um, so it's very much scalable there. It's very um, um, effective from a business context in um, providing efficiencies there. And if we move on to the next slide, I mentioned this briefly. Uh, this is about live event streaming, which I will, I can only say is, is in my opinion, guaranteed to become a major part of society in the future. It is currently already possible to watch live matches and live concerts in virtual reality and, and to get a front row seat to uh, to Wimbledon, to a Champions, a, cha a Champions League game, whatever it is you want to see. Um, and that will only get better, especially as the resolution of the headset improves and the streaming technology improves of the hardware. And moving on to the academic world in the next slide, slide 14, this is something that um, maybe you might have not, you might not have heard of before, um, except for maybe, uh, who was it that was mentioning the, the paranoia research? Maybe Julie? Heike. Heike, Heike. Yeah. Heike or, or Julie, and I think Liberty was also talking about it to some extent, pain treatment. Right. Um, this is around um, the academic world and particularly the University of Barcelona. Uh, there's a chap called uh, Mel Slater who's been working on this for a while, using virtual reality to actually tackle implicit racial bias and doing that by putting your body in the body of an avatar which has a different race to you and you embody it. In other words, you feel like you are that avatar and of that different race because as you move your hands and body in the virtual world, you see yourself in the mirror and it and it matches. Um, that has been shown to decrease um, levels of implicit racial bias. And there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more um, detail to this, obviously, but this is, this is me paraphrasing it. And I thought it was a very interesting use case of virtual reality. So, if we so go on, racial, yeah. racial bias in, in what sort of setting, you know, when you're interviewing someone for a job or? So I don't think they had a, and I'm just hypothesizing here, but I don't think they had a particular um, scenario in mind. I think right. it was more of the theory that everybody has a level of, impl of implicit racial bias. And this is not racism. This is mm. not a hatred for other races. But mm. this is, I suppose, in my words, a discomfort, a level of discomfort with uh, being with someone who is of a different race because perhaps you are not used to it or you haven't been... Um, with people or interacted with people of other races throughout your life, something along those lines. So it's not explicit racism, but it's also helping to tackle that implicit racial bias that we may carry around with us without knowing. Interesting. Yeah, and if we go on to the next slide, um, this is getting more deeper into the business side of things. Uh, this is actually around a, um, a scenario that, that Walmart uh, started uh, creating, and this was, I think, first quarter or second quarter this year, they announced that all 200 of their US training academies were going to implement virtual reality as a standard form of training for their employees, which is really interesting. And uh, if we go on to the next one, this is quite interesting. I'm pretty sure very few of you would have heard this. Um, this next slide is around legal visualizations. So I don't know if anyone out there has heard of um, 
the um, uh, virtual reality being used in a UK court of law. And uh, it actually has been used in, in UK court of law as a form of evidence. So in other words, how do we get the judge and jury to actually see through the eyes of potential witnesses of a road traffic accident to get to allow them to see whether they were able to spot that crucial point in the road traffic accident? So I think the um, the screen is flickering at the moment. Well, I, I can do it without it. Um, I yeah, don't need it's to... um, someone else is streaming. And um, actually, we we can't do very much about that. Um, it seems to be slowing down. So let's persevere. Yep, sure, sure. Um, do you want to go on to the next slide, Rohan? So this next one uh, you might have heard about. It got quite famous. This was the... the um, the United Nations create using virtual reality as a tool for social change. And they did this with um, an application called Clouds Over Cedra. And a number of other um, um, entities and nonprofits have been using virtual reality as a form of building empathy with the public and driving greater donations. And then finally, in the last two slides I'll mention quickly, uh, virtual reality has been used to sell everything from uh, Jaguar vehicles to, to uh, Coca-Cola cans. And even in PwC itself, we're using virtual reality to allow our real estate team to visualize uh, different elements um, of, our, of our offices and decide, even when they're not in the same place physically, they can be in the same place virtually and talk about this office and where we should place this or how we should use that space. Um, and finally, I thought you'd, you might find it interesting to know on this last slide that we're also using it as a way of um, immersing clients in the future. So helping clients to understand what's coming from, you know, uh, for example, the fourth industrial revolution. Will we have robotic police on the streets? Will we have, will the pension age increase to 85? Will yes. we have mega drones transporting people from one end of London to the other? Um, whatever it is. And we've tried to build that world out so our clients can experience it. And so we can have much richer conversations off the back of it. So we don't have to just be using pictures and videos and text and talking to try and communicate that future world. So again, going back to the storytelling point. Mm. Well, I, I imagine uh, the answer is yes to all of those questions you asked at the end, the end there. That seems to be the way we're going. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Um, we are uh, uh, almost on time, bang on time, half an hour. Um, that was fascinating. I, I think the conclusion is that VR is a, for, AR, are a force for good. Um, uh, and, um, you know, the impediments to, to using them are beginning to be sort of swept away. Uh, and it'll become more and more wide stream, which is quite exciting. Um, yeah. I look forward to Spielberg's uh, film. That looks pretty good. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, now is the time. You know, we'll, we'll have about 10 minutes of questions uh, or longer if they're really interesting and um, see what Jeremy has to say or indeed anybody who wants to answer them. Rowan has a question. Are you going to type it in, Rowan? Uh, Julie has a, 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 any questions if you because we can't uh, open the mic um, I, I won't go into it but we can't open it at the moment so if you put them into chat that would be fabulous so Rowan can you read that Jeremy Rowan asks um, we talked about VR and AR being not a matter of a single <coughs> app but a wider spread of intersecting services and applications yep I suspect the second part is coming yet. here we go <laughs> What past technology changes? What past technology changes do you think have similar properties to that? So I think if you if you look at a very well known technology or arguably group of technologies like the smartphone, I think that is somewhat analogous here, uh, in that um, the smartphone was not. You could talk about the killer app for the smartphone, but in all honesty, does that make sense really at the moment? A killer app for a smartphone? It's it's just um, it's not quite a valid question because there are so many different things that smartphones being used for. It's being used to help you navigate. It's being used to help you uh, communicate with people. It's being used to help you uh, um, spread your personal messages on social media. It's being used to help you um, take pictures. And it doesn't make sense, therefore, to say 
the killer app is picture taking. Uh, because that's just one facet. You might go into the camera side of thing, which is a technology in itself, and say, what is the killer app for the camera on the smartphone? Um, and maybe that would be a slightly more sensical question, but you could even dig deeper. But ultimately, it's very analogous in this sense that virtual reality and augmented reality, they are a medium, a new medium of intersecting uh, technologies in itself. So virtual reality and augmented reality are more than just headsets and content, which is just scratching the surface. But what about um, the the physical aspects of, uh, uh, for example, waveguides? This physical phenomenon of how you how you transfer light round a corner and into your retina in the augmented reality headset, so you don't have to have a projector right in front of you over uh, overcasting the real world. Um, you've got technologies like photogrammetry, which sit alongside virtual reality and augmented reality. So they help to actually take real world objects and bring them into uh, a 3D environment and potentially the virtual reality world. There are lots of these different intersecting points. And of course, when we, when we look at VR from a functionality perspective, very much like the smartphone, we're still talking about you could use it for many different things. You could use it for having meetings um, in, your, in your corporate environment. You could use it for entertainment, for playing games. You could use it to connect to the social media space, probably in the future to explore a form of internet, which is... Um, um, through virtual reality, perhaps. So there are many, many different facets. So there won't be any single killer app. Thanks, Jamie. Heike asks, how important will be the fact that you can use hands, but not the keyboard in VR? So this whole aspect of user interfaces, how you interface with a technology like virtual reality is an incredibly important question at the moment. And there's been a lot of attempts to, to test out what might work. For example, the Microsoft HoloLens, you've got um, gesture input, so you can use, um, you know, you can use your hands uh, to open up menus, to click on things. You can use your head to move it around and move the cursor, which stays in the center of your view. You could use voice recognition, so you can tell it to um, uh, open up this program. Uh, Cortana in, in, in Microsoft's case. But yes. interestingly, there's also a number of um, interfaces that are, are coming to life um, and are on the horizon. So eye tracking could potentially be another interface. How you move not only your head, but your eyes. So if I move my eyes over a menu and I hold it there for half a second, does it open up that menu? Potentially. Would that be annoying? Would there be a lot of mistakes made? Do we... Um, uh, do we... Uh, bring it, do we also have it, uh, do you also look as well as saying something to activate it? Um, and then there's neural input as well. So there's already a proof of concept hardware out there that allows you to take your thoughts, convert them into a digital signal that then outputs into the virtual reality world or whatever it is you want to, to change that world. So I think the whole point of user interface is not having the keyboard there um, at the moment, I would argue is is there's a bit of a downside to it because you can't do everything in your hands um, at the moment. So obviously we're very, very used to typing. We're very, very used to typing commands, um, to clicking on things with a mouse. Uh, and, it's, and it's just something we've been doing for years and years. So I think it is important at the moment um, that we extend our thinking and particularly research into the U the UX or the user the user interface design as well of virtual reality and augmented reality experiences to see how we can optimize it for the future. Um, thanks. Quick one from there's two from Liberty, but the first one is: uh, Do you have a favorite VR headset? She's going to buy shares. <laughs> um, I I have to. I'd probably argue that at the moment. My favorite VR headset is probably the PlayStation VR. Um, even though you know there are not many corporate applications for it, uh, the reason I like it is is because it's simple to use, um, it's relatively cheap, and it produces a high-end experience or a relatively high-end experience. So when I have friends over, um, I, sometimes uh, it takes me a, a while to set up the other high-end headsets, but. The PlayStation VR is usually good to go. I just switch it on. I turn on the PlayStation 4, 
Um, the experiences are generally quite well curated. So you know you know generally you're gonna get some high quality experiences. Um, and again, the cost of it, I got it on, on sale just before Christmas for 250 quid. And that got it, uh, and, and that came with Skyrim VR and the camera as well. So you can't really beat that price. It's, uh, it's all in all, it's a good package. It's a good package, which is okay. what I like. We'll have another couple of questions. There was one from um, Sun. It's running away. Let me find it. Uh, I think it was this one. When or what year do you predict that VR will be the norm for business as well as home innovations? Uh, no, that was it. Uh, I think Sun's was, how do you see virtual worlds fitting into the future compared to VR AR applications? <laughs> um, virtual worlds compared to VR AR applications. Okay, so I think um, I I'm interpreting that as, you know, we currently have a load of VR AR applications in industry and in the consumer world, but um, uh, was it was it when or, or how do I see it? Uh, Sun asked, how do you see virtual worlds fitting into the future compared to VR AR applications? Got you, got you. So I think um, I see it, I see it as a, um as 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 something that will definitely happen it's just a matter of when rather than if um i see it as being i'm trying to think of an analogy here an analogy could be it's a weak analogy but consider how um social media has proliferated throughout the world consider how the internet has become a massive phenomenon for connecting people in a certain way so on a 2d screen presenting 2d information for you as a third person not experiencing that firsthand. I think there is a space for virtual reality, not to replace that at all, but to act as an extension and as a separate technology to allow you to explore a form of internet or a form of connected space um, to allow you to create a, um, a, a space of your own, uh, and, and ability to visit other spaces to and use this world to very much communicate, uh, to learn, to um, to socialize along the lines of Ready Player One, but uh, hopefully not as uh, not not as dystopian. Okay. When when do you um, and this, this maybe a t sort of time horizon rather than a specific year, but when or what year do you predict that VR will be the norm for business as well as home innovations? So uh, liberty, I uh, I would say that um, if you look at if you look back, let's say the fa phase three of virtual reality, because I know we didn't touch on this. We touched on phase one, you know, the 1960s. We touched on phase two, the late 80s, early 90s. Phase three is the phase we're in right now, the 2010s. So 2012, Palmer Lucky puts the Oculus Rift on, on Kickstarter, asks for $250,000. We give him $2.4 million to bring that to life. Two years later, 2014, Facebook buys Oculus for $3 billion. And ever since then, every year, I've got actually a PowerPoint slide, which I don't have up here, but it literally has news clippings from 2014, 15, 16, 17, and I'm waiting to add 2018 to it, which is something along the lines of, will 2000 and X be the year of VR? And uh, I always chuckle when I see these because effectively what we're doing is actually quite incredible. And it's, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen in a year. It's not gonna happen in two or three years, maybe not in five years. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take humanity and give them a completely different medium of interaction um, in a sense that f for a long time, we've always been a third party person, you know, looking at a screen, looking at a book, watching a movie from the outside. But all of a sudden now we are the first person. We are in virtual reality, um, involved in the scene, and even from a device perspective, having something on our face so that we cannot see anything outside um, is not generally a medium we're used to. And again, going back to the keyboard and mouse point, uh, a user moving on from user interfaces like that, again, is a massive sort of step change in society. And how, how do you expect all of these step changes to take place um, in a matter of in a matter of years, it's simply not going to happen. So I would advocate patience. Yeah. Um, I would say it's inevitable, but it's probably going to take, um, I'd say, five to ten years time. Five to ten years. Okay. Um, a comment here from uh, 
Ptolemy, um, well, saliently says that she can, oh, it's just popped away, um, that she can see it helping the developmentally disabled um, who are unable to uh, read for them to be able to experience lots of things um, that they might otherwise read about. Absolutely. And then there was Julie's, there was a question about porn, which was um, interesting. 10% of the internet being porn and used for hands. That was following on from that. <laughs> um, there is one from Julie, which I, let me just read it. Um, so Julie, as we know, creates strategy and pilots in AR and, AR and VR. Uh, she was interested in your thoughts, Jeremy, around VR covering the eyes. Um, her clients are execs with all the benefits. Um, so really it's around uh, VR covering the eyes. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so you mentioned it's tough for your clients who are execs. Yeah. And I'll be honest, we also have a similar experience at PwC where you have you have a certain population that is, I'd say you split into groups. So one part is never going to put on a VR headset because they just they just feel either they feel um, embarrassed, they don't want to feel vulnerable, they don't want to look stupid uh, or feel like they're looking stupid. Um, they are happy to exp to see it from the outside. Uh, in other words, uh, not not get the experience, but but try and understand it from a 2D perspective, which just doesn't work. Um, and but they think that's enough of a, a translation. Um, I'd say there is not a lot you can do other than uh, other than wait for those people because I've had I've had a number of cases so far, and it's not a large portion of people. It's maybe five percent of people that will refuse to put on a headset. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't mention is actually a perception that they'll be sick. So I've had uh, people say, no, um, I'm, I, I get sick with these things. And I asked them, okay, so uh, what did you try? And it's either one of two answers. Either they haven't actually tried it, but they're just assuming they're going to be sick. Or they tried a very basic cardboard experience where they shoved a phone in there with some sort of rubbish roller coaster VR experience and yeah. they got sick. <laughs> and uh, well, I mean, it, it's not only the hardware at the end of the day, it's also the content. So I guess to answer your question, it's it's a matter of time before it becomes a more normalized part of society and it becomes accepted and people stop feeling stupid or self-conscious or embarrassed about wearing it. Um, there is an educational element, whether or not they're willing to listen, where uh, you can point to um, data, your own anecdotal experiences, statistics around the, the headset usage in the world, around how many people use um, your headsets and your experiences. Um, and I think that's all you can do, really. And also about the... Um, I just noticed this, but it's related, the sickness point. So from the research I've, I've read and seen and spoken to the, um, the medical professionals, there is going to be a portion of society that will always be susceptible to sickness in virtual reality, and there's nothing you can do about it at all. There will be a portion where who will feel sick, but they can develop some sort of tolerance towards it, and then there's a portion of people who... Uh, won't feel sick whatsoever and it's not an issue for them um the thing is a lot of people get stuck on the approximately it's approximately a third a third a third by the way it, they get stuck on the approximately third one third of people that are going to be sick in virtual reality regardless even if we optimize the content even if the hardware is great and to be honest um it's it's equivalent to saying you know these people get sick when they're on a train or they're in a car in the front seat, um, they get motion sickness when they're on a boat. Uh, what do you do in that situation? <laughs> I've had some people say, well, VR is just not going to work. You know, these people get sick. It's, it's a ridiculous technology. But following that sort of logic, are we going to ban cars? Are we going to ban ships now because they make some people sick? Um, it's, not a, it's not a particularly uh, a logical uh, perspective. We're going to ban people driving cars, driverless cars. Well, um we're coming up on the hour, um, and uh, we tend to finish uh, on, on the hour. So, so Jeremy, um, that was really insightful um, and uh, fascinating in lots of places. Um, so, thank you so much for, for for spending time with us um, this evening. 
uh, and for sharing your thoughts and ideas. It was um, my pleasure. Really thanks for having here. me. Um, and thanks to everyone who came along as, as our guests um, and asked questions and, and interacted. I hope you uh, enjoyed it as much as the, the Science Space team did. Um, we run these uh, Delphi talks regularly. Um, we try and do one a week. So do do look out for them. Uh, and they're on a, a range of topics. You know, we've had Oscar winning filmmakers and, um, you know, um, uh, improvisation, um, theatre producers and um, all, all the rest of it. So um, watch out for them. Uh, and we enjoy your company. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone. Um, I appreciate it.